Welcome to another installment of Show to Be with Mike G, the show of life, the show of serps, the show of gin, the show of mad fat science, a lot of science in this interview with Chris Harrison, one of the founders of Liber & Co. They have a wonderfully plush lineup of serps. You got a set of twins and you've got Chris that I get to know a bit better in this interview. A lot of science. I, I You know, there's lots of risks being an entrepreneur. There's a lot of math. There's a lot of labor involved there's so much stuff and at the end of it though i hope with conversations like these that maybe it will spark that inner passion or that inclination to start your own company it might sound stupid at first but just take the plunge i promise you it's worth it in the end but without further ado let's give a listen to my interview with chris harrison of liber and company Every day, at least. Fair enough. Yeah. At least, at least you know, one or two cocktails. I mean, I, I, I'm a cocktail guy, so I very, I'm usually uh, messing around with a new, new recipe or variation. But yeah, well, because it's part of the utility of having a company yes. that, may, right? Like, <laughs> but what if you, if you just sat down, yeah, separated yourself, needed something, a moment to yourself, away from everybody, sure. away from the business. Is there that thing you still drink? Yeah, if it's a uh, you know home alone long day, want to yeah. kick back, put on some tunes, um, you know this time of year it would definitely be an old fashioned, yeah, which which is standard. But you know it wouldn't necessarily be a bourbon or rye old fashioned with uh, cane sugar or anything like that. Right. I, I mean, I'd switch it up and, and do something with a different different spirit of rum old fashioned. Use some like, uh, but still those darker notes. Yeah. Winter it makes kind of makes some sense. Is that just uh, can you remember kind of the first or one of the first cocktails that you had that made you realize that booze was about something more than just getting fucked up on? Yeah, yeah, definitely the house gin and tonic that I had at uh, at um five one or no seven one five a restaurant in Lawrence, Kansas. Oh yeah. So that was my introduction to cocktails that were like you know craft yeah new premium, ones premium yeah and and creative sort of like because yeah, it yeah. was a house when was, what, what year would you say this was oh i know exactly when that was it was uh it was <laughs> what date was it <laughs> yeah it's 2011 i don't know the date exactly yeah uh yeah it was 2011 so i moved to lawrence kansas right after i graduated ut yeah and uh and that was early 2011 so that summer um i lived downtown went out to the bars that was like the premium bar good restaurant yeah, great yeah. bar did a lot of house stuff and i'd always ordered a gnt when i'd go out because it was just sort of safe you know yeah. It's like, oh, I can go to any bar and get a GNT, and I know what I'm going to get. It's not going to be completely horrible. It's not going to be overpriced. It's and it's not, not going to be like that I mean, impressive. It just yeah. can't be. Yeah, it's yeah. going to be middle of the road, and it's going to be safe. Yeah. And uh, and I saw a house gin and tonic. I was like, you know, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you know, are kidding? Was it in a barrel and stuff or kegged? No, it wasn't. They just had, you know, they made a house like tonic syrup. Right, right. And uh, it was completely ridiculous. It had rosemary and lavender and all this crazy shit in there. Yeah. It was this funky color. Like, what? And... Uh, there are things I loved about it, and there are things that are just way too wrong and weird. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but anyway, it's still thought provoking. Yeah, it was very right? much piqued your piqued my interest at the time, and then yeah. that's that's sort of the the cocktail that was a switching point uh, for me when you started thinking about. It. Did you uh, so so for example, when I grew up, my mom was like incredibly against drinking. Really? Which is the biggest irony ever, ever that like I own it a still. Where right did now. you grow up again? Uh, all over the place. Okay. You, like you, Salt Lake City, Roswell, New Mexico, Detroit, Phoenix, like all over the place. But my, you know, my mom. She she grew up in a family of alcoholics, so of course without any prejudice, I would imagine she wouldn't want me to drink. No less start a alcohol empire. I'm gonna call it a fucking empire right now. But. Wow, that's awesome. You go for it. But yeah, it's one of those things, right? Where I just it, I didn't grow up with it. No, no one really drank. My dad maybe had some margaritas every now and again, some right. chardonnay. My mom just didn't drink for as long as I can remember. But was it something that was kind of a social element of, of your family growing up? 
It was, yeah. Uh, my parents, um, born in the late 40s, they yeah. grew up in the 60s. I mean, they grew up with the Beatles and the Stones and Jimi Hendrix and, and everything yeah. that went with that. My mom lived in California for a while, so they were hippie. They were, um, you know, free love, where, drugs, where in, where, in San Fran or? Yeah, just outside like San Jose area. No kidding. Yeah, she lived out there for a while. Um, and they kind of carried that through up really until they started having kids. So my sister's older than me. She was born in 84. Yeah. Um, they kind of put that lifestyle on the shelf. A little bit. Around yeah. like, like late 1983, right. you know, when my mom's <laughs> pregnant. But, but yeah, they were definitely free spirited, um, definitely a hippie generation and had no problems with um, drugs and alcohol, really. Um, so, you know, my mom was always a big margarita fan. My dad yeah. was always a big beer drinker and never mm-hmm. like super high you know point of uh, making it premium or um you know expensive or anything like that it was right. just like you just you something just for the have, common man exactly just have fun relax and uh, enjoy it uh so yeah there was there was really no uh, prejudice against did, it they, did they come from kind of a creative background like outside of that meeting each other or the summer yeah. of love kind of thing yeah like, no not really i mean they're uh my dad was you know born in scranton scranton yeah but no didn't shit. but didn't live there long yeah. um kind of like you you know his dad's uh job took him, took him around and yeah. they lived in austin for a while they they lived down in uh, south texas which mm-hmm. is actually where my parents met um where they where they meet just going to school south furious yeah um community, community, college community college down there yeah um but i mean they were basically just kind of hard-working folks you know not really creative not artists not musicians yeah but they, um, they felt they dug it, right? Like they felt it. It was something that's like they're very open to, receptive to. Yeah. they get, And I think it was just, you know, they didn't really visualize the repercussions that I think some people go, if you push that too far, yeah. too many drugs, too many alcohol, that's definitely a bad thing. Right. Um, but they didn't, they didn't really kind of go over that hill. I don't think uh, my mom's side was, you know, super hardworking father worked in the oil fields. Oh, really? um, and, you know, it was it was rural texas it was pretty rural yeah. poor rural texas um but then the 60s were happening so you had this sort of massive contrast between yeah imagine what, it's what poor, their parents right? did you know they're born in the 20s what they did before them through the wars or the um world war ii so they were kind of had that whole thing going on and then 60s hit beatles free love yeah that was sort of massive uh I imagine dichotomy. it's like it's just this inner conflict, right? Like yeah. working hard and not being free because you're tortured or you're shackled to your job, but then yeah. at the same time. Yeah, that conservative so, root, that sort of anchor. Yeah, yeah. That, you know, obviously they haven't gotten away from even to this day. They're both uh, in their mid-60s now. Still working? My mom is, yeah. yeah. My dad actually is uh, sort of side working. He, he's, he may be getting a uh, adjunct professorship at a Del Mar College in Corpus. As no kidding. Teaching carpentry. That's what he carpentry. did. Carpentry. That's what he did his whole life. That's crazy. Yeah. Did he build stuff for you guys? Mm-hmm. He built our uh, our house. Oh no kidding. Yeah, with him and like maybe one or two buddies, and besides, you know, plumbing, and electrical, they did everything from, uh, you know, framework up to fit and finish roof, yeah. all that. Wow. Yeah. So you grew up then in South Texas. We grew up in Bryan. Bryan. Okay. Bryan. So okay. if you don't know if you call it Bryan East Texas, is it? No, I don't think it's like central. Sen- Triest. Yeah, Central exactly. East. It's yeah, right yeah. in the middle of the triangle of, of you know, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. It's kind of mm-hmm. like right, right in the middle. Yeah. College station area. But how, how is that? Because you don't really think of it as a big haven or metropolitan city. It's not. It's a college town through and through because yeah. of A&M. A&M. Um, but it's not like Austin in the sense of liberal and more a little bit connected to the outside world. <laughs> right. I mean, a lot of, uh, Insul- a lot of folks. Exactly. Yeah. A lot of folks that we went to high school with. We went to a big high school uh, graduating class over 700. And like maybe a dozen or 15 of us came to UT. That's it? Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. 20% maybe? Oh, not even close. Yeah. No, no. Like oh, no, sorry. 700. Yeah, like yeah. 2%. Yeah, way, way less. <laughs> uh, and most of them that did go on to college uh, just went right down the road to A&M. It's easy. It's what their parents probably did. Right? Yeah. And it's a good school. No knock against A&M. It's a good school. But no, it's, sure. It's but it's good school. for different reasons. Yeah, for sure. What was high school like? I mean, were you a sports guy? Were you a music guy? I was uh, neither of those things. No, uh, the best <laughs> way to describe worm? me was a, a nerdy biology guy that raced motocross on the side. <laughs> <laughs> Motor is a motocross a big thing in Brian? No, it's not. It's big in Houston and Dallas. Yeah. Um, but I grew up in the country, and I one day convinced my dad to buy a bike, which was a, a massive, massively dumb decision <laughs> for financial and safety reasons, <laughs> among others. 
but no, we, my cousin and I, uh, grew up in the country. We just rode around and then we'd go down to Houston or Dallas and, and race on the weekends. Mm. Um, no, it's a rich white boy sport. And it was looking back is definitely something that we should not have been doing. Um, Are there a lot of, uh, girls in the sport it's like, Mo- you, in motocross. Yeah. Oh no. There's to be, no, there's, I mean, no, they, no, sorry. Like you did it for you or you did it for the girls. I did it for the girls. No, I wasn't <laughs> doing anything for the girls really in high school, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, no, it was, it was mostly about the adrenaline. Mm. It was, um, you know, you go fast. There's a, uh, well, I mean, can see the appeal of it, man. Like the, it's a blast. It's a, it's a roller coaster that you have total control of. I mean, yeah. you're driving the ship kind of, and you're flying through the air. Do you ever get hurt? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I haven't broken any serious bones, broke my finger once and, uh, had, as I like to say, too many concussions to remember, but, uh, but nothing <laughs> Which would really make you serious. just loony enough exactly. to start a business. Exactly. That's, right. yeah. That's a good point. They say 10 is the cutoff for, you know, brain damage. <laughs> so what happens at 10? Do I don't know. Yeah. Did you just, the room goes dark. Hello. Exactly. Did you say something? <laughs> so you go from Brian to UT, you said, mm-hmm. what year did you graduate in Brian? 2006. 2006. God, I feel old. I love it. I love feeling old. Me too, man. Yeah. Do you do you really? Twenty seven. No, I don't now? feel old at all. I'm just kidding. I'm just trying <laughs> trying you to feel lament. spry as shit. What are you talking about? I feel good. Yeah. yeah I feel good. Yeah, we, we um uh, so we came over uh my graduating class two thousand six, started um that fall, graduated in two thousand ten. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And from UT. Yeah, biology. Biology. What were you hoping to do since it seems like a little bit of a detour getting into SERPs, but big detour. Yeah, absolutely. But not well, not that there's not some shared talents or some shared knowledge and stuff, but what were you hoping to do when you got out at UT? At the time, I really wanted to get into academia and do uh, research and probably pursue a professorship somewhere after a PhD. Like your dad, but he only did that later though, right? Uh, yeah, he's doing that literally now. Yeah, like yeah, for, yeah. Since the time he graduated UT in 71, I think, Yeah, he uh, had his philosophy degree, but he jumped straight into carpentry. Gotcha, gotcha. Working for himself. So this is like unique, unique to you. Want to mm-hmm. enter academia? What is it about academia that appeals to you? Though? Well, uh, it was sort of actually a presumed appeal, which didn't pan <laughs> what? out. So I, uh, I got my degree yes, in biology appeal. because I was just into biology. I worked on molecular genetics and evolution. Yeah. Um, did research, worked in labs at UT, and uh, wanted to, to test academia really before yeah. I jumped in to a PhD or graduate program. So I took the job in Lawrence as a research. Nebraska? Uh, or Lawrence, Kansas. Kansas. Yep. Kansas, sorry. Yeah. As a research associate. No kidding. So I did so that you, for so a year you, and a half. You finished UT, you said 2006, is that right? Uh, 2010. 2010, thank you. I, yep. Yeah, I'm, I'm just stuck on this day you graduated. <laughs> <laughs> so you so you, you take a, uh, a research assistant, assistant. Yeah, right, basically. in Kansas, and you're working on, what's what was really the scope of work out there? So the, the model was uh, fruit flies. So we were basically fruit doing flies. molecular genetics and evolution research. Um, on a very, very specific molecular genetic machinery in flies called pi RNAs. Interesting. It's pi RNAs. Pi uh, RNAs. Ribonucleic acid. Uh, that, yeah. And these were, the epigenetic research was studying sort of uh, non genetic inheritance, but still through the germ line of uh, factors that would affect the progeny. So you would cross two different flies, uh, uh-huh. a male from species one and a female from species two, and you'd get like, a sterile offspring but if you did the reciprocal it would be viable so we were studying why that was how it wasn't a purely dna genetic thing it was more of an epigenetic thing yeah and i don't I know what that means i mean we full, <laughs> full the epigenetic what is epigenetic epigenetic mean? basically means uh i think it literally translates to uh, above genetics so there's hardline dna yeah codes for um you know the basis code for protein um, uh-huh. epigenetics is uh something that can be inherited through the germline, through the generation, that is not to do with DNA. So it can be so oh, much as, as how the DNA um, interacts with itself, with proteins. Mm-hmm. But it can affect gene expression. It can affect uh, protein and, and eventually how the animal behaves and the characteristics of it. Interesting. So and what, that's what was... true in all all animals, including humans. There are yeah. documented epigenetic effects in humans. So why... Or, no, I'll step, step back for a second. So you're in Kansas... What kind of social life does a research assistant have? Like, you, you're bound to be in the lab, like, what, 10 hours a day kind of thing? Not quite. Pretty, I mean, I, those, are, those are the grad students who are in there busting ass to try to try to get their um, PhD in line. Um, yeah. I was more of a 9 to 5 guy. Yeah. But you were on the payroll, mm-hmm. making a living, so I was doing staff research. Uh, at University of Kansas. 
was it did it give you the opportunity or at least at some point the projection or the uh, trajectory that you would be able to teach there not probably there yeah. um academia i think in the sciences i can't speak for other disciplines but certainly in the sciences they really don't want you to follow up an undergraduate with a doctorate at the same institution they really? don't really want you to follow up a professorship with a doctorate why is that just to get the, the they just want knowledge and... yeah they just want to spread it around and get some mixing going on yeah. otherwise you sort of have like this stacked lineage in one institution mm -hmm. whereas like you went to undergrad there you got a uh, doctorate there then you became a professor and it's which is almost a, an extension of making sure that you have varied gene genealogy yeah like, exactly, you know, yeah. Like, we don't want to inbreed here at ut we you don't wanna, you like, don't want to do that you want to pull insight from from different sources i think it just kind of makes everything fresh and, yeah. and it's also collaborative that way for sure how long were you in kansas a year and a half i took that job early 2011 and then uh, came back to, to Austin in September. Was it something that did it drive, were you getting bored with it or did, was there some other opportunity that arose? No, there was definitely the, the opportunity for um, the company now libraries was basically at the point where we needed to consolidate, start consolidating in Austin. So were you, so you guys were a company while you were still in Kansas? Oh yeah. Oh, when did, so when did it get founded? So we incorporated in uh, late 2011. Okay. Okay. Was, that, uh, November, perhaps, because that's when we did December. Ah, oh, you, you beat us, bitches! <laughs> oh no, yeah, we won. Yeah, right, you yeah, won. We won. But I am still eight, eight years older, yeah, so I was really behind the curve. You won that <laughs> too. You before me then too. <laughs> Can't win with this guy. Like, damn it! <laughs> no, yeah. So we, we incorporated in December 2011, but it was you know it was a hobby at that point. Right. I was living in Kansas. But what it, what what was your capacity then in Kansas? What, what were you actually doing for the company back there? We were making our tonic. Okay. So we. I was really lucky in that my next door neighbor was the executive chef of the only big commercial slash restaurant kitchen in Lawrence, which yeah. was the Oread. It's a combined hotel restaurant oh, with wow. multiple bars, multiple things going on. And yeah. she was like literally my next door neighbor. No kidding. Day. And she she was into it. She was into it. She loved like the idea of it. You know, I was we were making this stuff on the stovetop and like, yeah. you know, a couple cup batches just to screw right, around right. and have some G&Ts at home. And she was like, hey, why don't y'all come in and maybe we'll use it in the bar and do all this stuff. And she was like, yeah, just come into the kitchen and start it. And so we're like, okay, I guess we're going to do some math here and scale up this recipe. Yeah, math. For... But you're probably bound to be all right at math. Yeah. We're, we're good at it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, honestly, I'm not even the best one in the company in math. That title goes to Adam. For was sure. it still the three of you mm -hmm. then? Yep. So the, from the very, very go. What, so when did you were, you, were you childhood friends with Adam and, and Robert? We all went to high school together. Oh, no shit. So, so we all grew up Brian. in Bryan. Or did, did they depart at some point and not go to Kansas with you or they went to Kansas too? No, they, uh, we, we went to UT together, did that whole thing. Robert and I graduated in 10. Mm. Um, and then, so I went to Kansas, he went to DC and, uh, Adam stayed around for a couple of victory laps at UT. <laughs> so he stayed here. So we were in three different areas when we started the company. Yeah. And it was, I think when I met you, yeah, Robert was in DC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even though it was formally based, you know, uh, in Austin, everything was happening in Lawrence. No it, we'd go so up there doing the prep, and, and the... they would fly in from really? Lawrence or from DC and from Austin. They'd fly in, and we'd make it over a weekend, and they'd like put some in their carry uh, in their check Every baggage event. and take it back home. Wow. Yeah. So, so what? Why? Why? Why did <laughs> I didn't mean? Because it's, yeah. it's it's almost like a a, psych, a schizophrenic move to to go and start your own business there's so much risk involved it's all on you well we were too young and money. dumb man that was the just, good you the naivety it, like, was uh was our big advantage you know yeah, we wouldn't no, have done it otherwise point. yeah that's a good point yeah I, you know a lot of musicians like when they get older they, they're a bit too jaded they've had too many experiences to be well and they, but they've seen it to, before you know yeah they know what to expect they know what can go wrong they know the best plan of action and and that usually is really something that's very difficult very expensive to do yeah whereas when you're you know as we were young and dumb you just sort of do what you can and make it work uh, what luckily did you, what was the end game for you probably uh, different than it is now but no it's looking? evolved uh you know obviously considerably at the, at the time the three of us wanted to do something entrepreneurial yeah entrepreneurial together we didn't know what it was <laughs> you know we would kick around ideas like you know we're gonna open a boutique men's clothing store and right, right. you know like Which we could we could too. walk into the bank and they'd be like oh Here's Three 22 year olds with no equity or anything to loan against. Yay! Here's a loan for a quarter million dollars to open a brick and mortar store. Right. So we wanted something a little a bit with lower hanging fruit. Yeah. And that's where we saw the opportunity with, with Live Run Company, which at the time was literally just a spice tonic syrup. And, you know, the 
pretend business plan that we drew up at the time said nothing of the world domination we're achieving now. Sure, of course so. not. Of course not. So what were you guys selling at that point? This is uh, 2012? Yeah, 2012. Yeah. We were selling a couple spots in Lawrence liquor stores, um, a couple bars. Robert got a couple cool accounts that we still have today in D.C. Uh, in DC. One of the very first ones um, was a grocery store next to his house. Oh, cool. It's sort of like a boutique gourmet grocer. Yeah. And he just walked in and said... Because the, the, the climate of 2012... It wasn't really yet. It was almost with, turning. It was like people were starting right to before, notice, right? Yeah. yeah, but nothing was really, really truly happening. When you know, was Jack Gross or uh, Jack? Wait, wait, was it? What's the other main one? The other that? like syrups company? Yeah. There's a Jack Rudy. Jack Rudy. That's yeah. One thing. When did he they got started a, a little before? I think he t- 2010. Oh, okay. late 2010. He got started. So a bit about a year ahead yeah. of us. Yeah. But and uh, and so Robert like had this case of tonic that he brought back in his luggage. Mm. from our first batch and walked in he's like hey you know owner of the store i want to make you gin and tonic and he did he's like you want to carry this stuff and he's like sure you know sold him a case on the spot yeah. that was our first sale he wrote it out to library and company which didn't have a bank account <laughs> you know so i was like all right sweet we got a paid. lot of similar stories with that actually where yeah. you don't have an account to cash the check exactly you, yeah and that's how you do it when, when you don't really have any other uh, resort you just start pushing it yeah you just do it mm-hmm. what else are you gonna do exactly you know? and so did w- were you still doing the lab assistant stuff when mm-hmm. you were cooking? Absolutely. But but the move to Austin was that that investment, that emotional kind of time investment, like I'm going to take this full time. Yeah, emotional and also career. You know, I yeah. at the time I was fully invested in biology and research, um, wherever that was going to take me. Mm-hmm. This was obviously a massive distraction. And, uh, you know, I hope my old boss isn't listening, but there were definitely days where the majority <laughs> of the stuff that I was doing was uh was directed towards liver and and yeah. not necessarily the lab well i mean this that happens i think it that happens. happens a lot yeah yeah it does so when did you officially make the move to austin september of 2013 13 so you guys are you've been in business for approximately that's about eight eight Year months something like that right yeah. like because you're incorporated or well, lc mm-hmm. december of 12 so we was actually more like almost or like december a year and a half yeah yeah how were things looking? You were like, man, this is totally going to be a good move. You no, know, we, we, yeah, it was, I wasn't going to do it unless it was right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, yeah, I, yeah. I definitely had to make sure that at that time we'd actually already launched um, our second product, the great, the Texas grapefruit shrub. Oh yeah. Which is and great. I think we may have actually launched the classic so gum syrup. Too. Third. So you had, man, cause we're gonna have to recap that too. Cause when I met you, you guys had the tonic syrup for mm-hmm. sure. You had that Texas shrub, yep. which was just fucking out of this world and i know a lot of people worked on it yep. rather sorry a lot of people used it and then i remember jared pena at brooklyn i don't know if you know this but he had a drink called the passenger that used a grapefruit shrub but they made it in-house gotcha. and so in other words the di- the narrative was kind of changing people <laughs> were saying oh you know what blueberry shrub grapefruit shrub all these kind of sour ingredients actually add to the umami flavor of cocktails and so it, it's an interesting time where you guys started doing that. Do you still make the shrub? We do, yeah. It, we do. It's it's our definitely our most esoteric and out there yeah. product. Uh, it's beautiful though. Still. It's really good. It's, Coconut vinegar is that right? It's champagne. Champagne, okay. So it's the champagne vinegar from California grapes. Mm. I think the bottle I had was from a Filipino coconut. It we made that switch about two years ago. Yeah, the coconut was really cool. It's all vintage and shit. I've been selling it on the grape. Hold on to that one, man. I think this pappy's worth something. (laughs) But uh, we made the switch due to just like a supply issue. We Mm -hmm. couldn't get it right, and you know, you just have to. Sometimes you just have to do things. I think it's a a switch for the better from the flavor perspective. Um, But yeah, that was uh, so a year and a half in. I took the plunge and moved down, and and Adam was already here. You know, he's he's doing UT. Apparently making a second lap yeah. at UT to <laughs> finish up. Maybe second or third. <laughs> Adam was still in, full-time in school when I moved in. So yeah. I basically got on live or full-time. Mm-hmm. Robert was, you know, living doing large. Living large in D.C. Was we he doing call po- him. Uh, politics stuff out there? He was, yeah, he was working for, well, not exactly. He was or working for uh, a yeah, consulting firm on Capitol Hill. Oh, cool. Um, it's not a bad skill to have to sell and to sell. Right. Like you absolutely. sell it, you moonlight it. Yeah, There's Robert. Kind of same set of skills. Robert's definitely got a, a very strong set of people skills. Yeah. Which, I don't know how you say it out loud. It kind of sounds derogatory, but uh, <laughs> he's just really good at, at communication and, yeah. and and with groups and, and a lot of people. So so, so a brief a brief aside. It's difficult for me, and I'm sure it's difficult for other people. Do you ever land accounts that you that they can't express whether it was Adam or Robert that did it because they're identical twins basically. 
Yeah, but that <laughs> only happens for people that are face to face. You know, yeah. on email, it's a lot easier. It's so so much easier. No, there because are definitely people around town who who call Adam Robert Run, vice versa. I, I just rather not call either one of them anything because I don't want to get it wrong. So this is the thing: Robert's a little taller. Okay, and okay. Adam's a little better looking. <laughs> what? The, but that's marginal. They look so similar. I don't even know how to how to, how to. <laughs> right now, it's easy. Robert has a nice full beard. Is it the beard? Okay, okay. And Adam's a little bit a little bit uh, trimmed up. Yeah, man. Yeah. This, I always was hoping that those kinds of brothers or those kinds of sisters would play tricks on their spouses. Oh. But Robert, Robert's not married, right? Robert is married. Adam's Robert's not. married. Adam's not. Yes, yeah, so you, you have no that, idea which one's which. This is I know. Great. Does it, does I could just be screwing this? with you right now. <laughs> well, no, which one you are. You're the you're the tall one. Like that's that's easy. For I'm me. the extra tall, extra good looking one. That's right. See, you got everything they didn't get. Well, the brains. The interviews. The interview. <laughs> <laughs> I think about it and it's like, so they're bringing Adam? They're bringing Robert? You can do they're them both. You know, like both? they can both be here at the same time. Will, I'll, will I forget mid-interview which one is which? Like, I even, I'm very perceptive. At Name time. tags. I hope I don't. I don't know. They, they wouldn't even do it, would they? They would definitely do it. Yeah. I hear you guys they love listen like to this. it. They love shit like this. They are all over this kind of stuff. Well, it's good. It's, I hear you guys uh, listen to them when you're packing up and stuff. Or, oh uh, yeah, we Bob. do. We uh, we we've heard Sanders's, we've heard Tober, we've heard um, I think probably two or three more. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting, man. It's been a really interesting platform to kind of chat with people, and I've known you for for years now, mm-hmm. and I never thought that it would come to this where I have to interview your ass. <laughs> well, it's been, it's been formalize great. it, formalize it. That's well, fun. so I went. You guys moved at some point to a new facility that's nice, shiny, bright, clean, great equipment. Plate filtering, if I recall, and you guys were working on the pomegranate syrup at that point, yep. which is now totally done and ready to go. Yep. So walk me through the product lines as we see it now. So I know you've got the tonic, mm-hmm. you've got the gum syrup, yep. you have the pineapple gum syrup, you have the um, the grapefruit, the grapefruit, yep, the shrub, right? Yep. What it was, so what else we got here? So we have the uh, the grenadine, which the is grenadine, the pomegranate yeah. syrup, and we the latest one we've had is. Uh, fiery ginger syrup that's right so the ginger so you're talking six syrups now six syrups is it ever really difficult to keep up with all those varieties in production it is uh you know each bottle we have two different sizes so we have a, a smaller like eight and a half ounce retail size mm-hmm. and then we have the larger 17 ounce size which is usually what the bars and restaurants go for the larger um one. so yeah you sort of have to juggle that and make sure everything's in stock yeah uh it's not too hard right now you know if, if it's hard it's only because there's some sort of you know, cash crunch. Sure, sure. Where you're like, you turn around and you, someone ordered, you know, 40 cases of pineapple and two weeks ago you were totally fine. And now, yeah. now you're, you're just like 40 cases, big, this big order, plus all like those, you know, two to four case ones. orders that, and yeah. suddenly you're like, oh shit, I better order some glass because in two weeks you're going to be sold out. Yeah. Uh, so those things sort of happen. It's hard to forecast, isn't it? It's hard to forecast. And this is our first good year of like full numbers. Yeah. So yeah, 20, yeah, yeah. 2015 with Robert coming on uh, full time is going to be like, okay, this is exactly how much we sold. This is what trends, you know, summer pineapple does great. Yeah. Winter, no one's buying pineapple because right, it's such a tiki out. kind yeah. of thing for, for spring and yeah. summer, right? Whereas, you know, a gum Tonic syrup. Probably does pretty Tonic's well. pretty middle. You okay. know, it, it can, it's a little bit boosted in the summer. Yeah. But gum syrup spikes in the winter months, old really? fashions. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then ginger too. I think ginger just kind of one of those. Ginger would spices. make a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so why, or what is the process for you guys picking which New products, products you're going to focus on? Yeah. Well, we've sort of branded ourselves around essential bar syrups. So sure. we, I think the lens through which we view something is, is, is it essential bar syrup? And, yeah. uh, you know, gum syrup makes perfect sense. Yeah, and Total looking utility. back, you know, some things don't make a ton of sense. Like a Texas grapefruit shrub, as beautiful as it is, as interesting as it is, yeah. it's really not an essential bar syrup. But that was something that we did three years ago, and it wasn't fully formed, and it's right. been an evolving, ongoing process. The experimental phase. Exactly. So, yeah. so right now, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, it's hard to really forecast, but but stuff that are that are essential. So uh, an orgeat, a lime cordial, a passion fruit. So those had, things are is on the, the deck. The lime cordial out. Lime cordial is not. Lime cordial. You guys have been working on it for a bit. We've right? been working on it. I'm, I think I'm on about 37th uh, iteration. Oh, of that Jesus. What's, a, what a, what's hard to balance in that one? It's it's hard to balance uh, lime. Lime is really tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, fresh lime juice is really sensitive, really perishable. Yeah. Uh, we also don't just want it to be, I think, a, a lime syrup. Mm-hmm. Um, we want it to be um, 
you know, lime cordial is kind of a preserved lime syrup, so it has yeah. other stuff going on in there. Um, and so that's a balance unto itself. When we really started formalizing that project, the lime crisis of 2014 hit. Man. You remember that? Yeah, it's gonna when a box of limes was just like as much as the Pappy bottle. Yeah. Oh Jesus. Yeah. Micho uh, Micho Khan, right? Yeah. Micho Khan. Yeah. Micho Khan. They had. Uh, I mean, there were the mob and bad weather. So yeah. it was like two two really bad things happening at once. Um, so we've kind of put that on the shelf, when yeah. we, which was a bummer. Um, secondly, uh, you know, we do everything with real ingredients and. Lime juice is sensitive, like I mentioned, and it, it, it changes color. So we're yeah. working on some of the How do you, is there stability. a way to preserve the color of the lime juice without giving anything kind of Yeah, terrible in it. Yeah, um, that's the open question. Yeah. That's that's one of the things that we're working on with that. Um, Citric acid help? Citric acid powder? Well, those? lime juice is already, you know, on the pH scale, it's sure, 2 sure, It's sure, super sure. acidified uh, with primarily citric acid. Yeah. Um I don't really exactly know that. I mean, you know, I'm sort of the science guy in the group, yeah, so I need on, to know Chris, this. What's but the deal? Exactly. I'm working on it, man. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we'll you figure said passion, it out. Passion fruit as well? Yeah. Yeah, that's a big what, it, what, 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 What's the, the raw product you get in? Is it, It's not passion fruit. It's about to be a puree. Is it a juice? Or? It's a, a, a not, it would be a not from concentrate passion fruit yeah. juice. Oh, wow. Which is tough. And that's one that the bars, I think, like a hurricane. Yeah. That cocktail. Oh, yeah. Like every you gotta have it, right? You gotta have the ability to make it. Someone's gonna order it sometime. Yeah. And then the tiki craze is coming back, so it's really, really good fit in there. It's a beautiful syrup. But that's one where you really can't go down to the market and like grab a passion fruit and make that at home. Yeah. It's like it's out of the season. If it does have one, it's gonna be funky. It's gonna be old or unripe. It's just right. not gonna be good. What do you what do you think is the main characteristics of passion fruit that you would expect in its prime? Oh, it's uh, super, it's really tart, number yeah. one. So uh -huh. it does have that biting acidity. It's fresh. It's lush. It's got, uh, you know, like citrus notes, like lemon. Yeah. There's a lot of lemon to it. A lot of sweetness there. Um, it's tough to describe. It's very unique, which yeah. I think is a really a big selling point for it. Mm. There's nothing really like out there that you can substitute with. Yeah, it, I was going to say know? there's not something commercially available. Yeah. I mean, you go to Asia and eat one. Yeah, you but can you can different. find some purees and stuff like that, but that's got a lot of solids in it, and it doesn't really work super well. Yeah, in a in a drink, so we want to do like a pure passion fruit syrup. Has the grenadine been doing? Grenadine's been excellent. It's yeah. been really good. Very that's, very like again utility. Yeah, everyone knows grenadine. Like mm. you don't know what a shrub is, you don't know what a gum syrup is. Okay, we'll help you out there, but like you've heard of grenadine. Your grandma probably has a dusty bottle of roses grenadine sure, in the yeah, back, yeah. along with her dusty bottle of angostura. Yeah. Um. So that's less educational the only thing there for us is is switching and saying hey it's not an artificial cherry syrup right it's a really beautiful pomegranate syrup um california is that right it is yeah, yeah. it's a third generation uh organic family farm that's amazing it's like a husband and wife team the guy patented his own press they grow and press really? on pomegranates send the juice in raw we uh we process it we filter it down using a wine filter and it's amazing yeah i saw the plate filter guys using, yeah the right? plate and yeah. frame is is really cool um and so how many markets now all over the place? How many, yeah. Or rather, how many states? I think something like 35 states. That's incredible. With a sort of a shotgun approach, you know? We sure. don't have a lot of deep market penetration anywhere. Yeah. But, uh, but being the ubiquitous. The good liquor is, store. Yeah. Yeah. The good liquor stores, uh, the good bars, they find us, they know what we're doing, and then there's a trickle-down effect from there. Yeah. How do you feel about the, the... So you guys are kind of on this parallel movement to that of the spirits. Absolutely. And... Obviously, creating good tools, you can use your products with a, a craft spirit. You can use your products with a corporate, corporatized spirit, whatever, right? Do you think, how do you feel about all of these distilleries popping up? Do you feel it's a good The craft thing? distillery yeah, explosion? The, the, the kind of mid to low, low uh, mid to mid range down, I'll put it that way. In okay. In terms of production, right? Not like a big, massive one like Patron opens a new distillery or something. Not something like <laughs> yeah. that. But like something like us, let's just say, even though you're like not genius. talking about us. Sure. Yeah, like, for example, like genius. Well, I think it's makes a lot of like logical sense. You know, yeah. when you have an explosion of interest in the market, people are going to want to do that. I think it's also mirroring a little bit of um, just sort of the general move back towards, you know, makers yeah. and craftsmanship. Yeah. It's like, a tangible goods. Exactly. And yeah. there's some of that with us. You know, we keep our production house, but I think it's. It's good. It's it's a little bit in its adolescence right now. I think sure everyone is. everyone has finally opened up and said that, you know, some of this stuff is not as good as we want it to be. And it's probably yeah. not as good as the makers want it to be, but we're working on it. Why do you and, think people release stuff when it's not as good as they want it to be? Money? Well, they definitely have to. Um, you know, even from us, like uh, the first time we released the Grenadine, 
the filtration uh, and the color was not what we wanted it to be. Yeah. But we got aesthetic, this stuff, which is kind of forgivable though, because the flavor is bound to be where you guys wanted it, right? Yeah, I and mean, we're but not exactly, not yeah. like one hundred percent. There's always like this, uh, you know, ideal up here. Right. Then you're always trying to get a little bit closer, a little bit better. Yeah. Um, so the initial offering in the market, uh, even for really big companies, not necessarily just us, you mm-hmm. know, us small craft guys, uh, but you got to put something out and that's a really good way to test. And the market also gives you feedback. So, yeah. and you were it, talking about that just uh, earlier. Yeah. You got some good market feedback and you guys have you said tweaked the tonic recipe a little bit. Yeah, we have. So when we put that out, it was, uh, an agave base. That was the sweetener. Oh, okay. A dark, um, like a dark, dark nectar or light dark. Yeah. Like oh. full on tequila, you know, notes yeah, and real like all that stuff. Sandy, yeah. yeah. And we thought it was cool. And that's, that was, I think the most important thing is that it was cool enough that it got us motivated and, mm. and wanting to go in and make this stuff and, and mix up a G and T as crazy as it was. Uh, then you move on and you get a little bit more refined. You get some market feedback yeah. uh, and you say, okay, what were people saying? Well, they were just saying it's really different. It's yeah. really different. We like it a lot. It's really different. It's you're really afraid, different. But it's like when your parents say that, it's like, yeah. oh, Mike, your yeah, your girlfriend, different. she's different. She's different. You know? Yeah, yeah she has it's when they don't know what to say. She has or... tattoos and piercing. And wears a lot of black. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, no, that's all true. That's all true. <laughs> so that's sort of the market feedback that you get, and then you just try to incorporate that, make sure it aligns with your brand image number one. And yeah. All of our other products were the cane sugar. It made a lot of sense, and we pretty well convinced ourselves before you even made the change that it was the right thing to do. We already had the product and stuff, the base product, the base yeah. sweetener and stock. Anyway. Yeah. And it, uh, you know, it's not a paradigm shift. It's still fundamentally pretty similar, but yeah. it's just better, cleaner. You're just getting closer and closer to that perfect product. And I think that happens with every product. Yeah. You know, even the passion fruit that we'll put out, you know, we may put it out and it'll be, you know, pH 3.2 and, you know, we'll do some testing. We'll get some feedback from bars. You know, it's a little too acidic. Okay. Right. Let's, let's what do you, how do you buffer? water or do you use like gypsum or something you can use uh the funny thing is we've actually never really gone uh up on ph too high okay. yeah uh, we never really had to start low and come high um yeah you can use uh you can use basically like uh, what amounts to baking soda i see okay. um but we wouldn't do that i mean there are there are better ways like you said buffering uh sugar affects ph yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. water even factors. a little water and yeah. even supplier like if, if we get a passion fruit that's just super tart and you know, maybe it's me, it's passion fruit. It's like, okay, this is really nice and bright, but it's it's kind of biting and a little bit astringent. It's so yeah, sour. Yeah. Let's try something, uh, you know, from Puerto Rico or wherever. Yeah. So it's a lot of ways to to get at one problem. It sounds like, do you, do you have a particular, so you said you kind of started in craft cocktails, at least in terms of where your flavors mm-hmm. and your interest and creativity was peaked. Do you still have a big interest in how people use your syrups? For sure, because if they don't use them, then we don't have a company. <laughs> so we have to be interested in how they use them. Yeah. Um, you know, right now, I think we haven't really seen the push on premise yeah. as much, um, but we will. What, that, what, why do you think that? I, yeah. I think there is a little bit of a dichotomy because, excuse me, dichotomy, because you have really creative people mm-hmm. that are the master of their domain behind the bar, and they often want to create that stuff themselves. They do. Do, do you feel like it's a it's a difficult conversation to have to say like, oh, sometimes this might. Yeah, it depends. You know, it's a lot of personality things and, yeah, and yeah, even yeah. the bar and kind of what it prides itself on. Uh, sure, there are bartenders out there in bar programs that feel like what we do steps on their toes. Yeah. And that's fine. That's like, that's totally cool. Sure. We'll, we'll probably learn be, from them. Yeah. And there will always be people like that anyway. Yeah. And that's, that's cool. But there are, uh, you know, the other 99.9% is not that way. They're like. Give us something. There's something use. else. They're, yeah, they're either like the vodka Red Bull, which no one is talking about anymore, right. or they're somewhere in this vast middle ground, uh, whether it's Chili's, who can put out like a, still probably has like a pomegranate martini menu somewhere. Right. But like, that's like a little bit better than what is on true, true, true Dirty Six. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then there's, you know, all the way up to the 99th, 98th percentile, the drink wells, where, you know, they're not Using too a- proud to use our products, right. um, but they still... Uh, they use that pineapple gum syrup. Yeah, they used that for a while, for sure. Yeah, uh, over the summer. Again, summer, summer, summer. ingredient. <laughs> but uh, so yeah, there's this big middle ground where we where we work. And we want to see how people are using it. Um, but it is mostly uh, sort of a, an educational thing for us. Yeah. A lot of times, if if a bar doesn't necessarily know what to use pineapple gum syrup with, uh, right, you know, right, ing- like suggested 
Spirit enters pairings. Chris. Yeah, oh, the enters the Live Run Company's marketing team, which is <laughs> something to One of three behold. dudes going at any particular point. <laughs> exactly. I, I, do, you, do you feel like at this point, things have, you've got a good presence. Mm-hmm. You've got what might be like a real up and down kind of forecasting 40 cases in one day, like you said, two, yeah. three cases the other day. Do you guys have pretty distinct roles now? Or have they changed at all? Like you and Adam and Robert. Compared to any other company, no. no. <laughs> Compared to where <laughs> yeah. we started, yes. Yeah. Um, you know, I do a lot of the operations stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I do a lot of uh, record keeping from a production standpoint, uh, ingredient sourcing, product dev development. Robert is uh, all over the books, yeah. all over QuickBooks, uh, finances, bills, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, Adams. So what's uh, that, what, what is Adam doing? Adams. What, what's, he's picking up the Robert slide, and I right? are trying to figure it out. <laughs> no, Adam's Adam's a mastermind pie in the sky. Yeah. You know. Marketing guy? Definitely marketing PR guy. PR and branding and stuff? A lot of vision, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, Adam's, Adam's doing what Adam does. <laughs> it's necessary. We're all necessary and we're all sufficient so far. We're all sufficient. We're we're a, a trinity of sufficiency. Yeah, but we do share a lot of rules. I mean, there's a no major decision happens without all three of our inputs. Yeah. And the really good thing about being odd is that it can come down to democratic vote. Yeah, for sure. So. Do they always vote the same since? No, they the don't. <laughs> Not at all. I'm per- I am so astonished right now. I would no. just imagine that Adam <laughs> Robert, they're ide- almost they're not identically. Clones. <laughs> you you can tell me all you want. They're not clones, Chris. But they look like clones. They talk like clones. They, they talk like clones. They got a haircut like clones. <laughs> so all that. Well, let's take a moment then to the to discuss the bottle that you selected. Everybody's different, and I love that. And this is actually a very modest bottle, but really, really delicious. And actually, the more I keep drinking it, the more that I can tell that it's really just Weller Twelve. But this is the Van, the Van Winkle Reserve. Lot B, 12 year, probably something just a little over 12, but 12 for the most part. It's 45.2. point. Well, it's got to be the lowest age. The age. lowest, right, yeah. And it's from some secret part in the, the Buffalo Trace warehouse that actually there isn't a Lot B, from what I understand. That's it's why a it's big, Lot, quote, B. B, yeah. <laughs> Great. So, but it is still really accessible, really delicious, really balanced at 45.2. What do you what do you think? It is. I agree. It's uh, It's not very corny. No, it's got a lot no, of no, a lot of spice not. character, I think, to me. Yeah, um, it's really nice. It's uh it's very red. The color, it is incredibly red, which isn't is it? which is funny. I'm noticing that in the bottle. Yeah, uh, but I also feel like it's. I, I'm getting this weird kind of optical optical illusion from maybe the enclosure, although that doesn't make a lot of sense. And there's red notes on the label and stuff. Yeah, sometimes like it encor- encourages us to to think that you know. But you're you're right. It's got a very beautiful color. These are essentially. The Weller 12 honey barrels. That what I is heard. a honey barrel? Honey barrel is basically you go through the barrels and you taste because they're all this is all barrel slack. These, it's the, not these are the magical. best, the best. That's the honey. That's right. Yeah. That's what the but it's marginally is. better than Weller 12. Yeah. And this is three ninety nine now resale, mm-hmm. and that's what like kind of going rate is for Lappy, which is just you know people rolling over in their graves. I'm sure Pappy Van Winkle is rolling over his grave, but Weller 12 is still twenty nine ninety nine. Yeah. If you can find a bottle, and that's. That's really interesting. It's crazy, right? Because that's all marketing on that one. Yeah, marketing. And uh, do you think it's overt marketing on their part? Or do you think it's just the, the market itself kind of running off on a tangent? It's it's, it's a good point. I, I feel like, I'll put it this way. And I thought about this this week because I, I did my my dealer. I call, I'm going to keep alluding to my dealer in these Fair. podcasts. And he'll call me and I say, which ones do you want? I'm like, well, these are, these are the ones I want. This year was a little bit of a struggle, right? So last year I got a Saz 18, no problem. Um, probably I can't recall what I spent on. Let's say like three, three fifty, something like that, which is still a lot, but for that bottle, it's not a, really 18, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. But this year, and that was this is the last year for Saz 18 too from that same tank, mind you. And so I went in, and I was doing my my annual cleanup. And I got a. He's like, these are the ones I've got. I'm like, well, how much are you charging for the Saz 18? And so he couldn't, in good conscience, he wouldn't charge me a thousand dollars for him because I buy so much stuff from him. He's like, well, I got a guy coming in. He's going to spend like a thousand bucks on it. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? A thousand dollars on a size 18? And he's like, would you want the Eagle Rare 17? And I'm like, maybe. What is it? And he's like, 550. I'm like, what the? Really? You got to give this guy a budget. Yeah. It's, it's insane, right? Because it, it's just been inflated so much. And this year, for some reason, and I don't know why, 
maybe because all of the late adopters are finally kind of coming on board with the bourbon. I really think what's happening is that people aren't drinking it. They're trying to sell it. Yeah. And just moving it around. Yeah. And I, it's ter- It's a terrible thought. And I almost feel like because people are really trying to do that, because you and I have the knowledge of these enclosures mm-hmm. that we could easily counterfeit all these enclosures and do a big fuck you to people that are buying bourbon like that. But yeah. I won't do it because I love bourbon. But it, it's it's at an interesting point now. Maybe we'll have to switch over to what the uh, the Romans from South America are doing with those like uh, tamper-proof enclosures. What, what are they doing with those? You know, like the Ray and Nephew, when you pop it open, it has like that double plastic thing oh, where you have okay. to kind of like shake it to kind of get it to flow right. Oh, interesting. And no, you can't pop it that. off. Like if you do it's that, a, it'll break the bottle, I no, think. No kidding. Um, so that basically prevents people from popping it off, dumping it out, refilling it, no and then shit. remarketing it. You know, Buffalo Trace also said they have some sensors in the labels starting this year. Really? That you could read and, and kind of like check if they're defects. So I don't know. But that wouldn't prevent someone from refilling it with, uh, you know, hooch. Absolutely. <laughs> or Weller 12. Yeah, yeah exactly. But these are like nice enclosures. At, at any rate, so it's a nice bourbon though. It is. You know, and it's it's great to share it with The you. funny thing about Van Winkle for me is, you know, I've never really seen any ads for it. No, never. No, it's so, in movies. Yeah. And people talking about it. It's whispered. Yeah. It's like the dudes on Wall. I bet my my friend Jonathan, he lives in Brooklyn, and he does some production work for, for film and for TV and stuff. And it's just like the way he talks about guys talking about Happy Van Winkle and Wall Street and stuff. It's like, really? No fucking, Is yeah. it made it up there? Yeah, I do. Oh, it's a huge thing. Like, oh, guess what I'm having? Pappy 20 or Pappy 23. It's like, I'll blind taste any of you fuckers. And you're going to yeah. be able to tell the people. They'll probably think it's vodka. Yeah. <laughs> Something, but yeah. it's frustrating. An oaked, and it, an oaked vodka. An oaked vodka. Of course. Which, which in a sense, maybe. Which but, exists. Yeah. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely did that one. But Beam is still kind of pretty honest. It's not like highly sought after. They, they do release some amazing kind of, uh, you know, perennial bottles or seasonal bottles. Heaven Hill is still pretty accessible. Four Roses, that stuff's pretty good. But yeah. They're a small batch uh, yeah, series or whatever they have. Yeah, it's really good. The limited edition this year is mm-hmm. particularly good. But so, do you with with the spirits marketing spirits marketing market rather changing mm-hmm. so much? Craft distilleries are booming, but then they'll start falling. What do you think it's going to take for you guys to remain relevant and to remain in the black? Well, it just mean all we need is for people to keep wanting to drink well. Yeah, that that's it. I mean, as as long as the the top mixer is not Schweppes or Red Bull, yeah, then there's a space where we can operate. Right. Um, and I think that that ever since cocktails were, you know, won't get into the history, but conceived in America, yeah, you know, 150 years ago plus, uh, it's been part of our drinking culture. And there's a wide swath of drinking culture that is not premium, is not pretty, right, right. Uh, but there's always been cocktails, which has always been. Um, well to do it's always been marked by at least some sort of premium quality mm-hmm. um so i don't really think that we can uh fail unless something cat- catastrophic happens unless we just completely misstep uh or something like that i mean i think it's we're always gonna be relevant yeah uh in the same way that any good gin any good bourbon uh is gonna be relevant um, it kind of change the conversation and, and hold, yeah. enable people to drink better which is something that a lot of people don't take dear to their heart but you guys are really you know, if you think of a, a cocktail made with your gum syrup sure. versus a cocktail made from a simple, yep. just regular, there's a richness there. There is. There's a there's a difference. And uh, and that, you know, it's debatable, you know, how marginal that is. You know, yeah. we haven't ever had someone say, I blind tested our, your, our simple syrup with your gum syrup and couldn't tell the difference. It's always been like, this really makes a difference, which is yeah, a nice is. positive feedback that you yeah, get. Yeah. Uh, but then there's just sort of the more wholesale thing is, which is there are... St- hundreds of cocktails that call for non-alcoholic syrups yeah and so there has to be a commercially viable option for non-alcoholic syrups absolutely and the only ones that have been around you know the roses the finest calls uh get short shrift from anyone in the know yeah uh you know whether it's uh a a super premium uh you know pdt type bar Mm. the drink wells uh but even just like the marriott like those guys are wisening up and they're yeah. not using that stuff. They're like, this is not It just doesn't good taste as good. Yeah, it doesn't taste as good. It's uh, There's no commitment. There's no brand uh, aesthetic that we, that resonates with us. Um, the ingredients are wrong. Yeah. Uh, this doesn't work. So we're going to try to make it in-house. Whoops. 
this sucks. We're getting in the way of the line <laughs> chefs who are trying to prep dinner because we're yeah. over here with a little kettle trying to like stew up some grenadine on the stove. Right. Um, so that's where we come in and, and I don't think that's going to go away. Yeah. It's a good point. Like we really do have a particular niche where mm-hmm. you can make something that's really beautiful and textured and rich. That It's also really nice that it's a, a worldwide phenomenon. I mean, the resurgence of, of craft cocktails in general, Yeah, you know, you can get the same really high quality uh, Jack Rose in Sydney as you do in Berlin, um, as you do in Austin, Texas. So yeah. that's, I mean, the market is is huge. So besides the the passion fruit and the lime cordial, is there something that's like the white whale for you that you guys would really like to do? That the lime like, cordial is the white whale. Is it the white whale? Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll come out and say that. Uh, yeah. I mean, orgeat's on the deck. Yeah, um, which that's a be, that'll be a great one. A lot of people will adopt that. I think. Yeah, they. Yeah, um, that one, hibiscus actually. Oh, really? Good uh, is really really nice. Um, like whole organic dried hibiscus flowers. Yeah. Um, really beautiful, incredible color. Um, really good tiki applications there. Sure. A little bit of a crossover with grenadine in terms of yeah. Smoke. I was gonna say it, it actually is a nice mid range, yeah. kind of non tiki, non traditional mm-hmm. winter something that could work. But there are, there are a lot of those, and you know there, you could even go crazier, and you could say, okay, what do these bartenders want to use, but they really can't do yeah. in house, and then that opens up the whole door, like you know cucumber syrup, yeah. just something I'm just throwing stuff out. But there are a lot of uh, even savory stuff, like herb based stuff. Yeah, I mean the product range. You look at the other like the big syrup companies in the world, Monins, uh, mm-hmm. Gaffard, Tarani. They have 75, 150 products. So many. And just going all over the world. Like, right. And so, you know, we won't be there, you know, anytime soon. Do you soon. want to make that many products? Not necessarily. Yeah. You know, I don't know if we could. Given, well, it's not a matter if you could, but like, if you wanted to do it, you would do it. Yeah, I like the spirit. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. I mean, I got a lot of faith. We only got six right now. Yeah. But it's still a lot. I mean, it's a good, it, it's a good collection of, of yeah, it's things. good. It's a good base. Um, 2016, I think we'll, we'll launch some more. Yeah. There's you guys some... doing any holiday bundle packs or anything? We are. We're doing some gifts, gift packs. We launched those last year. They were really good. We sold out way too fast. Oh yeah. So we got those back up. Um, and we're, we're also, yeah, getting in the educational game. So we have sort of a bar essentials kit. Yeah. You know, two piece tin shaker, Hawthorne strainer, uh, proper jigger bar spoon. Right. Because a lot of people really like the idea of cocktails and they sure. it's like getting in them and paying 12 bucks at the bar for them. Yeah. But when it comes to making that home, uh, they can be intimidated. They don't have the right tools. So we try to just, you know, here's, here's the base set of what you need. You can make hundreds of drinks with this stuff. Yeah. So where do you, where do you get one of the holiday sets? Is it in retail or you get at the, the shop? Just on our, on our website. On a website. few select spots have retail, uh, with the gift packs, but, but we're still on a mostly on our website yeah. online. It's good, man. I mean, it's been really wonderful to see you guys grow. Thank you. And just put out stuff that I would have never fucking thought. <laughs> you know, the pineapple gum syrup, brilliant, brilliant idea. And it's, it's still That's actually my, my personal favorite. There's nothing to dislike about that. You yeah. can drink it by itself. You can drink it with some rum. You can drink it with some soda water. Yep. Like all of that, you know. And yep. it's 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 really great. And one of the things I think is really important to do here, like when we do the, the podcast and get to talk to people is one to get like reveal personalities, sure. but also to get kind of gritty with people that are entrepreneurs and like they're, st- no, they're bad days. Oh fuck. Yeah. They're bad days. Oh dude. I don't want to, <laughs> there's, there, there, there are always bad days. Yeah. But at the end of the day, if, if you look at it and say, well, at least we put out six solid things mm-hmm. that are each unique, each fulfill their own particular need. And they're all delicious. I mean, you feel pretty, at least, can you rest easily knowing you did a good job? Not easily. Somewhat easily. Somewhat you easily. always got to have sort of that next level that you're trying to get to, whether it's a new product or a fine of the product or just sort of more a day-to-day thing. Yeah. You can't totally take a deep breath, but you can definitely be happy. You can always, reflecting is tough. Like you look back and it's so easy to just gloss things over. But from where yeah. we were three years ago, fresh out of college, knew nothing about business, knew nothing about Anything to do POs with starting a company. Yeah, that, that was yeah. just completely Greek, you know. And uh, and I think the most, the thing that we rest easiest about is just our, our own confidence in ourselves. You know, yeah. it's like there are a lot of problems in the world and we're just really good problem solvers. So yeah. whether that's uh, machinery broke down, the class got delayed, PO didn't go out on time. Right, right. Someone didn't like the shrub because they don't like vinegar. You, know, you can handle all that as long sure. as you just work through it, rest on, you know, sort of. Come back to your your goals, which is, you know, put out a great product, take care of people. Yeah. Um, and it'll, it'll be fine. So the last thing t- that I want to chat about is it seems like 
we, you know, we were at the USBG holiday party on Sunday. Mm-hmm. It seems like you guys have been welcomed open armed into the, the community. I'd say so. Do you think that that's because of your personality or do you think that the industry and the community here in Austin is just that communal? I think it's probably more to do with Austin in general. Yeah. Just the culture of, you know, Southern hospitality, basically. Sure, sure. Um, and we knew that just growing up. You can see that. Uh, I think because Robert and Adam and I all grew up here, that's that's in our DNA. That's in our personalities. Yeah. So we we give back. You know, we, we get that from folks, and so we, we throw it back at them. Uh, and it just works well together. Right. I think it would be a different story if we were some nice guys from Northern California yeah, yeah. and then came down here, you know, even though we're all, you know, nice and right, friendly, right. Yeah, it yeah. just sort of wouldn't be the right dynamic. I think being local helps for sure. Yeah. If people have been really re- receptive to the products and, and to you guys. They have. Yeah. Kind of like new kids on the block. Yeah. Like and they're younger than everybody And sometimes else. they look at us like, you know, what are these little kids doing? Like, That's are they right, going to figure yeah. it out? And they're like, we'll get there. <laughs> yeah. Give us a break. It's been good, man. And it, again, it's been really great seeing the growth. And uh, if you get a chance to thank Robert, for singing karaoke with oh me. they'll probably call you tomorrow and ask when they can come on <laughs> uh let's see how let's see how it works out let's see how it works out man well, Chris, that was good thanks so much for sipping some bourbon with me and thanks for talking about library you guys are doing great work and thanks for the samples i'm going to use them right away right on thanks, thanks mike man. cheers another scientist another entrepreneur another great conversation with a friend chris harrison of library company chris and i as Genius was starting out, we had a lot of conversations. We're kind of sharing ideas, thinking about flavor and things. So he and I have known each other for some time now, and it's been amazing to see the growth and the popularity and the success of Liver and Company really grow into so many wonderful products. I mean, the pineapple gum syrup, for example, is a staple of Texas Tiki Week, and I can't imagine what will happen once they nail down and lock down that lime cordial. But thanks, everybody, again, for listening to Show to V with Mike G. No matter what Mai Tai you may be sipping, no matter what gin and tonic you may be testing out at a new bar, keep being entrepreneurs, and also, please keep dancing. <laughs>